Welcome to Venice Beach, California, famous for its astonishing views and charismatic inhabitants. But what most people don't realize is that in its prime, this part of town was meant to be America's replica of Venice, Italy, complete with a massive canal system, a shortly lived tourist railroad, and elite architecture. Although many of the canals have since been filled in, the railroad tracks have been torn up, and this part of town is completely incomparable to Venice, Italy, traces of that time do remain. And today, we will uncover their forgotten past. So join me as we discover the lost canals of Venice Beach, California. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. Our story starts when the West was wild, and a man named Abbot Kinney was on the hunt for his new frontier. Abbot Kinney, born in 1850, was an American entrepreneur and adventurer best known for developing Venice Beach, California. Born in New Jersey, Kinney was an adventurous spirit from a young age, traveling extensively throughout Europe, Asia, and Africa. He made a fortune in the tobacco industry, but his passion for travel and exploration defined his life. In 1891, Kinney visited Venice, Italy, and was captivated by the city's beauty and charm. Eclectic as he was, he imagined recreating that city, but in America. Kinney's vision for Venice was grand and ambitious. He wanted to create a beautiful and functional place with canals, amusement parks, and a grand promenade. Yet how this dream ultimately became a reality is in itself a fascinating story. You see, this vision was a stark departure from the area's origins as a fishing and hunting tribal ground for thousands of years before Spanish explorers discovered it in 1542. The land became Mexico in 1821 before ultimately falling to the United States in 1848. It's also important to note that Abbott, as such an avid traveler, also had a unique perspective on the fleeting nature of life. As he primarily worked in handling the purchasing of products, sales trips saw Abbott in Egypt and Turkish Macedonia. When visiting a port in modern-day Greece during the winter of 1876, Abbott witnessed a horrible massacre at the hands of a Turkish mob and barely escaped with his life. This event caused historians to speculate that with a newfound lease on life, Abbott wanted to focus on leisure. From this point on, Abbott traveled to Europe, India, Ceylon, New Guinea, and Australia. He actually considered laying his roots in Australia, but for undocumented reasons, continued his journey to Hawaii, and then ultimately back to the mainland to return home to his family. A notion that would never really entirely play out, as an unexpected snowstorm in San Francisco would send him south. And this was certainly the turn of events that led him to his eureka moment. In 1880, Abbott Kinney arrived in San Francisco, but due to heavy snow blocking travel east, he found himself stranded in the city. While waiting for the situation to improve, he heard about a health resort in Sierra Madre and decided to travel there, but upon his arrival, when he attempted to check into the hotel, he was turned away due to a lack of a reservation and a full house. With nowhere else to sleep, the hotel staff, perhaps generously, allowed him to stay in the parlor room for three days, where he'd fallen asleep on a billiards table. Sleep didn't usually come easy to Abbott, who was an insomniac and rarely slept. Yet when he woke up, he felt refreshed, and his asthma had subsided, even though he hadn't visited the health resort. This experience may have been due to the climate, but it was enough for Abbott to settle in Southern California. As a result of having enjoyed the best night of sleep in his life, a declaration was made. The Venice of America would be constructed in Southern California. He also wanted to build a cultural center to attract artists, writers, and intellectuals worldwide. And although the odds were stacked heavily against him, the die was cast. The end of the 19th century would see Abbott diversify his business activities in California with citrus farming and hotels in Los Angeles. He also enjoyed courting a lovely lady named Margaret, the daughter of a California Supreme Court justice. The couple married after seven months, celebrating their first child, Lucy, just two months after marriage. As his empire grew, so did his family and the conflicts with his partners 
who also shared controlling interests in his company's Ocean Park Casino, purchased back in 1891. As a solution, all parties elected to dissolve the LLC and a coin flip would establish who divvied the assets. Abbott won the toss and chose the marshy, undeveloped southern half of the property to build his Venice of America, a replica of Venice, Italy, on the shores of the Pacific. The construction of Venice Beach, California, then known as Venice of America, was a massive undertaking that took several years and required the work of many engineers and laborers. The first step in the construction process was to drain the marshy land on which Venice Beach would be built. For this task, a team of engineers created a system of canals that were both functional and aesthetically pleasing. The channels were designed to allow boats to navigate through the area and serve as a centerpiece of the upcoming resort. Next, Abbott oversaw the construction of numerous buildings and roads, including the famous Venetian-style architecture that still stands today. The ornate buildings were designed to mimic the architecture of Venice with arched windows, ornamental facades, and intricate detailing. In addition to the canals and buildings, Abbott built an amusement park with a roller coaster, a carousel, and a ferris wheel. The amusement park was a major attraction, drawing in crowds from all over. To make Venice Beach more accessible, Abbott also built a railroad that connected the beach to downtown Los Angeles. This connection allowed for transportation of people and goods, and it helped spur the area's growth. Later, streetcars were added, providing an efficient and affordable mode of transportation for locals and tourists alike. The final result of the construction process was a world-renowned destination that offered a unique and vibrant culture, eclectic art, and stunning beachfront. On July the 4th, 1905, Venice of America officially opened, and it was an immediate hit. Visitors adored the beautifully designed Venetian-style business district and the stunning pier with its massive auditorium and ship cafe. Guests could explore this resort via a miniature steam railroad or gondolas. They could swim in the ocean or take the saltwater plunge. But perhaps more than anything, people were amazed by the canal system itself. When the canals were first built, they were a significant engineering feat. As I mentioned before, the marshy land had to be drained to create this system, allowing boats to navigate the area. From there, Abbott hired a civil engineer experienced in building irrigation canals. The team built a 500-foot-long conduit beneath Wilworth Avenue to fill the channels with salt water. Two pipes supplied water to fill the canals and excavate the lagoon. The lagoon was turned into a giant pond where mock naval battles and aquatic competitions were held. Progress on the canals could have been faster. So in 1904, Abbott hired the Hall Construction Company to complete the digging. With human and animal power and a newly installed steam dredging machine, the Grand Canal and Lagoon were ready to be filled with ocean water by the planned opening on July the 4th, 1905. Approximately three miles of canals were built including Coral, Cabrillo, Venus, Lion, Altair, Eldebaran, and Grand. He successfully sold numerous building lots for permanent homes along the banks, many of which still stand today. Surprisingly, throughout this process, Abbott built a tent city on the banks of the Grand Canal to house visitors and workers of lesser means, a tradition that has perhaps since been continued or expanded upon. A city of canals is a very romantic notion. However, sometimes, when fantasy becomes reality, problems occur. You see, the water management system installed was inadequate to provide circulating ocean water to the canals, resulting in foul-smelling and stagnant water. So when Abbott Kinney suddenly passed away in 1920 and was laid to rest in the Woodlawn Memorial Cemetery of Santa Monica, there was no one left to protect his vision. Almost immediately, the public demanded to fill in the canals. Filling in the canals would have resolved the putrid odor, and perhaps more importantly, it would accommodate the increasing numbers of automobiles in the area with expanded road surface. So when Venice was incorporated into the city of Los Angeles in 1925, those in favor of eliminating the canals convinced the city policymakers to take action. By 1929, many of the canals built by Abbott 
were filled in and replaced by roads. By the mid-20th century, only a few of the original canals remained, and they were often used as dumping grounds for trash or other debris. Understandably, this encouraged the locals to prompt for their removal as well. However, it was a hot-button topic. As half the citizens really hated these filthy canals, the other half could see potential. Hence, in the 1960s and 1970s, the remaining channels became a hotbed of activism and community involvement. Ultimately, residents banded together to fight against development and further destruction of the canals, and eventually they convinced the city to restore them. The canals were dredged and clean, and new sidewalks, bridges, and plants were added. It's funny to think that the absolute defining feature of Venice Beach is so easy to overlook, which is why I'd like to show you a little more in depth what remains. Starting at the modern day entrance of Marina del Rey, we are met with three inlets. The southernmost is Bayona Creek. This 8.8 .8 mile long waterway flows from Los Angeles River through Culver City and the Del Rey District before emptying into the Santa Monica Bay. The creek is a significant part of the local watershed and is essential in managing the area's stormwater runoff. To be thorough though, this creek is often confused with the canal system, but it's entirely unrelated. It is a partially man-made waterway, which was originally a natural creek that flowed from the Baldwin Hills to the Pacific Ocean. Still, it was modified in the early 20th century to control flooding and facilitate development. The lower portion of the creek, which runs through Culver City and the Delray District, was channelized with concrete walls and a concrete bottom in the 1930s. The upper portion of the creek, which runs through the Bayona wetlands, still retains some of its natural features. Just north of the creek, you have the massive entrance to Marina del Rey, which is also unrelated to the canal system. However, its history is fascinating all the same. You see, oil was discovered in the land that is now Marina del Rey in 1929, and over the next few decades, numerous oil wells were drilled in the region. Then, by the 1950s, plans were made to redevelop the oil field into a recreational marina. The oil wells were gradually capped and removed, and the area was dredged. Converting this oil field into a marina took several years, with the marina officially opening in 1965. Today, Marina del Rey is one of the largest man-made small craft harbors in the United States and a popular destination for boating, fishing, and other water-based activities. And despite its history as an oil field, it's also a thriving community with a mix of residential, commercial, and recreational properties. Notably, it's at this entrance that the modern day Seagate providing water to the existing canal can be found. Beyond that gate, we have the modern day Grand Canal. I couldn't establish if the southernmost part of that is man-made or natural, as its shape seems somewhat organic. Perhaps this was once a connecting point between the system and smaller, natural inland waterways. Anyhow, the Grand Canal runs north to the five other remaining canals. Four run east-west, whereas the fifth runs north-south. Many local homeowners have small watercraft in their backyard, and various blocks have pedway bridges of a historic nature. So now let's take the modern-day Grand Canal to its conclusion where the waterway dead ends into the appropriately named Canal Street. And it's here that the canal disappears under the streets of Los Angeles. In the past, the Grand Canal would have continued north to where it met two miles of passage and seven additional canals. The epicenter of this section was the Grand Lagoon, or today's Windward Circle. Sadly, this entire portion of the network has been paved over. Today's Grand Boulevard would have been the then Grand Canal. Lion Canal is now Windward Avenue. Coral Canal has become Main Street. The Aldebaran Canal was turned into Market Street. Cabrillo Canal became Cabrillo Avenue. And San Juan Avenue now covers what was once the Venus Canal. All that remains is a fragment of the original vision. In its prime, authentic gondolas from Italy took visitors on romantic voyages around Venice Beach under the beautiful Californian sun, offering sights of the miniature railway circling the neighborhood with sounds of joyful roller coaster enthusiasts enjoying the twin track racer named Race Through the Clouds. Aside the traffic circle in Venice Beach, a lone gondola replica commemorates the lost lagoon 
but it won't be going on a voyage anytime soon. Although the magic of Venice Beach remains, time has shifted it into something new. And although this story is unique, there are many examples of fading marvels throughout America, like the forgotten workers' village that was constructed to build the Hoover Dam and its many forgotten secrets. Which is a tale you can explore right now by clicking this link. And until next time, this is Ryan Sokash, signing off.